Welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome here tonight for conversation with Paul Grabowski. I was absolutely thrilled when the Monash Alumni Department asked me to interview a man who has been an entertainer and inspiration for countless generations of Australians. An ARIA award-winning uh, performing pianist, composer, film scorer, festival artistic director, and now educator, the executive director just announced of the Monash Academy of Performing Arts. Paul is an incredible talent. But as I, when I met Paul yesterday, I was thrilled to discover that he's also a brilliant mind and a fantastic storyteller. And even more importantly, Paul was a fellow captain of debating at Wesley College back in his day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Grabowski. Thanks for coming, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Paul... You know, one thing that struck me when I was reading about your biography and other things is the way that you described music for you as being a calling mm -hmm. rather than something that, that you worked out and developed. And I'd just love to understand. Let's go back to the beginning. Where did you discover your passion for music? Well, Victor, I, I, I think uh, it's safe to say I was never really going to be anything but a musician. Uh, when I was a very small child uh, in the pre-talking stage... Um, I must have been listening to music. I mean, there was music being played around the house. My brother, Michael, was a musician, and my father, Alistair, spent some years being a, an amateur drummer. He had a big band during the Second World War in Townsville. I think it was a very good way to enjoy the Second World War, being a drummer in a big band. Um, the band was called Grabowski and his Hot Shots, uh, which is probably explains why he didn't pursue it as a career. But... Um, <laughs> It entertained the forces in Townsville. He was actually building airfields for the Allied Works Council. So there was music, you know, we, we loved music. But um, I was a late arrival. My brother was 16 years older than me, um, and there are no intervening siblings, so I can only assume that I was the result of one gin and tonic too many on <laughs> a particular <laughs> New Year's Eve. And. Um, as can be the case with late-born children, um, the fact that I didn't speak pretty much at all until I was about two gave my parents some cause for concern. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but then when I did start speaking, I spoke in complete sentences, which suggests that I'd been listening to the world, the oral world around me, and trying to make sense of it, and trying to, you know, compose um, a model of reality based on sound. Um, and music was something that I was very, very drawn to. In fact, uh, one of the first things I'm reputed to have said was take five, because it was being played over the loudspeakers at the Point Leo Surf Lifesaving Club in 1960. And it was a hit at the time. And uh, that raised a few eyebrows, you know, that this toddler was going to take five. I mean, I should have had dark glasses and been clicking on the offbeats as well. But, um, so, look, it was pretty clear to my parents that there was something very unusual uh, going on. And as it transpired, I, I was obsessed with music as a child. And uh, my mother used to take me to a second-hand record store in Richmond. Right in Chapel Street, Richmond, um, and we used to buy used 78s, so those shellac records which preceded the long-playing LP. And my time as well, I think. <laughs> and I would, uh, I would take these eminently breakable objects home and wash them in the wash basin uh, to try and wash the scratches off them, you see. I don't have a, a compulsive sort of... Uh, cleaning thing going on. I'm not an obsessive compulsive person, but um, maybe I went through that phase. Music was just something which helped me to make sense, I think, of the world. And when I started to uh, show that level of interest, my parents bought a piano when I was four, mm. and I started to mess around on the piano, and then I started uh, piano lessons when I was five. And my teacher at uh, Sindel Primary School, which no longer exists, but um, he was a fellow called Peter Hillebrand, and he was an amateur church organist. And he suggested to my mother that maybe uh, I should be 
under the musical care of somebody a little more serious. Um, and so he suggested to her that I start piano lessons with a man called Mac Yost. Mm. And Mac was the senior lecturer in piano at the Conservatorium of Music at Melbourne University, the other university. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I stayed with Mac from the time I was seven until I was 19. He, he was like a second father to me. And very much imbued me with what music as a calling means. You know, he used to talk about music, not that it was easy for him to talk about music because he had a, a legendary speech impediment, which meant that he would get stuck on the reef of certain consonants, marooned for endless seconds while he tried to get over those consonants. It was, it was a profound stutter, quite incredible. Um, but it masked an incredible sense of humour uh, and a tremendous humanity. And he used to say that music was a metaphor for life. He, he mm -hmm. made me understand that music was a way of understanding the world. And I think I had kind of already started to um, intuitively feel that but he really helped me to realise it. And then the next stage in the realisation of that was when I went on my own course, which was learning about jazz music and learning to own the process of making music. So these were all steps along the way to the calling, if right. you like. Mm. So your early education on piano was mostly in classical music? Oh, right? exclusively, exclusively. Mm. Yeah, um, Mac had been uh, a Russian-trained pianist. Um, he'd uh, also had lessons for, uh, with the great pianist Ignaz Friedman, who uh, I think was a student or a student of a student of Clara Schumann. So there is a sort of interesting legacy. Mm. With pianists, you know, there is a kind of a teacher legacy which can lead back to some very key figures. Um, but yeah, he, he, uh, he, he trained me in, uh, in the classical repertoire. He was particularly serious about the music of Bach, mm. to whom he always referred as the, the master, the master, because that was a word he could say. And, um, you know, Chopin was, was the other mm. person. But, you know, Mac was a musical explorer himself, and he was the first person to play the Concord Sonata by Charles Ives in Australia. So, you know, he was a person who thought very much outside of the square, mm in terms of repertoire. And you know, over those years, we talked about a lot of music, and he introduced me to a lot of music. And when I broke the news to him that really it was jazz that I wanted to play, uh -oh. <laughs> he was completely understanding of that. I mean, he had the, you know, the, the breadth of understanding and the openness mm -hmm. uh, as a human being to, to, to get that for certain musicians, you know, the jazz experience, that the improvisational moment is really the quintessential musical moment, not the interpretative moment, which is the essence of playing classical music. So how did you discover that spark, that for you it was improvisation that really worked for you? Well, Victor, I think I'd always improvised at the piano. My, mm. my uncle, uh, John Shaw, uh, was an amateur sort of stride piano player, and he used to get me to always play when I went around to his house. Mm -hmm. And I, I used to do these little tricks like, um, I, had, I had a Reader's Digest book of popular songs. And the popular songs, you know, were popular songs from the, starting with the 1890s through to the 1950s. So they weren't, weren't rock and roll songs, they were pre-rock and roll, but they had mm -hmm. all the standard tunes, you know, they had the, the uh, Cole Porter songs, the Jerome Kern songs, Rogers and Hart, the Gershwins, they were all in this book. So before I really knew anything about jazz, I already knew these songs. Mm. And I used to do this thing where I would play a bar of the song in the written key and then I would modulate, you know, up a semitone for the next bar and then down. And, and there was a bit of a joke. I thought it was a bit of a joke, but he thought I should go on new faces and do that, you know. <laughs> Um, which I didn't, I'm pleased <laughs> to say, do. Uh, so improvising, you know, being spontaneous with music and making up my own things, 
that was all a part of my life. And, you know, I went to Wesley College uh, and um, that was one of the first schools, certainly in Victoria, I think, possibly in Australia, to have an active jazz group that you could be part of, like being in the football team. Of course, now, these sort of jazz programs are very common. Uh, they're all over the place, and, and the standard of them, in some cases, is quite extraordinary. But in those days, in the 1970s, this was a very radical idea, and um, run by a guy called John Lee, who you know, ended up becoming the, the head of music at the school. In those days, he was a music teacher and an occasional teacher of commercial studies, actually. He taught, he taught accounting. Wow. Um, Both sides of the brain, they always say. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that he really dug the accounting thing, but um, <laughs> he loved playing the baritone saxophone. I remember that. Mm. So, you know, I, I got to play in this band, not because I could play that sort of music, because I really had no idea how to play that sort of music, but I could play the piano quite well at that stage and um, so I was given the opportunity to play pretty much by default and I discovered that well I loved to play the music you know the music really I loved this kind of swing thing I didn't know what it was but the idea of playing swinging music and being part of a swinging band and being in a rhythm section and feeling rhythm in that way you know you don't Mm get that experience playing classical music. It's a very different rhythmic paradigm. Um, And the thing about jazz is that essentially it's a a collective music. Mm. Now jazz is at its roots music that is generally played by more than one person and the idea of the music, if you like, is that they have to work together to create what we call the groove. Mm. Not, you know, the groove is not the property of one person in a jazz group. It's a collective process. It's something that everybody contributes to. When I talk to students about swing, what is swing? You know, it's a very hard thing to define, as is jazz. I mean, jazz itself is a very hard mm-hmm. thing to define, but swing, you know, which some people maintain is an essential component for music to be described as jazz, is very difficult to pin down. So I tend to describe it as a heat, I I describe it in sort of, in its sort of physics terminology. Swing is a heat generated by the friction caused by people playing the same pulse in music, by which we mean the regular pulse that we all have, but everybody interprets it slightly differently. So one person's playing slightly behind it, one person's playing slightly in front of it, one person might be playing right on it, And that friction caused by the slight being out of sync with the pulse is what swing is. It's a very pleasant feeling generated by the heat of a musical friction. Now, that doesn't help you to swing, knowing that. That's a pretty dry assessment of what swing is. But as a player, I can tell you that, you know, that's really kind of what it is about and I started to get that feeling when I was playing in that band at at school when we were um, when I was in my HSC year as it was called in those days 1975 we went to perform at the Methodist Ladies College you know and of course Wesley College in those days was a, a boys school and it had been for many years a very typical English style school, big on sport, big on blokey stuff, and you know, building great blokes, I think, uh, was, was their deal. It's changed a little since then. <laughs> yeah. Um, under the, you know, the, the shepherding care of the Methodist church, we were going to be great and, and pious people. Well, um, you know, during the time that I was there, the, he- the headmaster, whose name was David Prest, he really changed the school a lot, to his credit. And he brought it out of uh, a sort of, you know, 19th century idea, British Empire kind of idea, into a modern sort of world, starting after I left to introduce uh, girls to the school. But also he championed what music meant, you know. Um, He he actually thought music was as important to the school culture as the first 18. 
And so I was a beneficiary of that idea. We went to play at MLC and we did a lunchtime gig with the big band. And it was mayhem. It was, uh, those, those girls loved this band. And they were very demonstrative of their, <laughs> of how much they loved it. Uh, we nearly on. caused a lunchtime riot. It was like, you know, the Beatles had come to play. And I think, you know, that was one of the key moments where I decided, you know, I think there's something in this. <laughs> this, this is a potential career path for me. I'm not going to get this playing Chopin somehow. <laughs> you know, I might get a certain thing going on, but not this, and I like what's happening here. So, you know, it, it appealed to my basest instincts. And um, I have to say that as an artist, you know, art is about squaring the circle of all of the things that make us as a, a human mm -hmm. being. You know, we deal in the dirt of life and we deal in the highest possible things that a human being can aspire to. But we don't, I think, choose to exclude. That, that doesn't mean mm. that you know, being an artist is an amoral or you know, unethical kind of occupation. We make our moral conclusions, or we draw our moral conclusions in the act of creating what we create. But nothing is off the agenda in terms of being considered as an artist. And I think mm. all great art is expressive of that. Great artists have always you know, considered the very best and the very worst of the human condition in trying to construct what art yeah. is about. That's it. That's it. So this is yeah. fascinating, and <clears throat> I'd love to come back a little bit later to discussion of the role of music in society. But first, I'm, I'm interested in your hunt for that elusive swing. Mm. Uh, and I understand that that took you all around the world from 1980 to 1985. Yeah. You went to Europe and mm -hmm. the United States of America, played mm -hmm. with one of my, my idols, Chet Baker, yeah. I hear. Mm -hmm. and, um, did you find it? Did you find swing? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, swing now, you know, once you've found it, it it's part of you. Mm. Once you know what it is, it never leaves you. Uh, it doesn't always happen in every musical situation. But, you know, once you know the ingredients of how to make it happen, mm. you can actually cause it to happen. I think a good jazz musician can make things swing. A good case in point is the first great jazz musician, Louis Armstrong. Now, Louis Armstrong mm. only had to play one note, you know, to cause things to swing, because it was where he put the note and it was the shape of the note, you know, the envelope of the note, the attack the fat sound and where it sat in relation to the beat. Louis Armstrong is swing. And then Billie Holiday, you know, she can sing one simple line of a song, the corniest song in the world, and where she puts those notes, it swings. Charlie Parker, Lester Young, John Coltrane, in a very different kind of way, Ornette Coleman, Miles Davis, it's all about where you put the notes. Miles Davis used to say, the most important notes are the ones you leave out. Mm. And that's right. And that's absolutely right. So do you find there were a lot of differences in the jazz that you were playing over in Europe back then with what you'd been playing in Melbourne or Australia before you left? Oh, well, you know, in those days, there was hardly any jazz around in Melbourne. Mm. There was traditional jazz, but I wasn't interested in that in those days. You know, that was, to me something to run away from. I came around to understanding much more about it as I got older. And now, of course, I see all that music as being one thing. But in those days, I wanted to really do something radical. And, you know, I was young and I, I didn't want to play traditional jazz music. Funnily enough, now, a lot of people who are, who are my age or who are in their early 20s now, not now that I'm in my <laughs> early 20s, but the okay, age that I was then. God, am I getting out of this? Um, you know, th it's now radical to play traditional jazz music. Mm. That's, that's a kind of radical choice because it's, it flies against the grain of, in a way of what you would think is the normal thing to do. But they do it for all the right reasons, that's for sure. Um, 
But the, the point was that in Melbourne in the 1970s, there weren't, there weren't any modern jazz gigs. There was a place up in Fitzroy called The Commune, which is where Brian Brown used to play, and that was the only regular modern jazz gig, really. They started to develop when I, after I had left Melbourne, when Vince Jones's first band started, and there was a kind of a revival of interest in contemporary jazz music. But um, we had to just create the gigs that we played. We had to find a venue. <laughs> I mean, in those days, it was such a different world. I remember we, we found a venue. It was the Glass House Hotel in Collingwood. And I was playing there with a great alto saxophone player called Barry Duggan. We were playing some pretty out there music on a Sunday afternoon, I think, something like that, or a Tuesday night. Anyway, the musicians' union came down and they shut the gig down, you know, because uh, we weren't playing... We were, well, we weren't playing for union scale, we were playing for the door. Duh. I mean, you know, they weren't going to pay us to play this music. Um, so the, the union shut down the jazz, which is an irony, I think. But, Amazing. Um, you know, I, I escaped from Australia. I escaped. I, I needed to go and play this music, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to play it here. And a whole lot of my generation did this. There was a whole group of people who left at that time, and they started to come back, you know, in the mid-'80s, late-'80s. Uh, and I think my generation, not me, but my, the, I was part of a group of people who led a sort of revival of contemporary jazz music in Australia, which was no longer about one group of musicians playing in Melbourne and another group of musicians playing in Sydney, we were starting to think about a national voice for the music. And I would have to say, by the way, that in the 1970s, there was far more going on in Sydney, modern jazz, than there was in Melbourne. Sydney was where it was happening. Hmm. It's really interesting because nowadays, I guess, the, the scene in Melbourne and, and Sydney and Australian jazz is absolutely thriving. I had the experience of studying on exchange in Miami yeah. in the United States, and my reflection on, on coming back was, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, a, it's an old established culture and there's a lot of depth, but the best things going on in Australia right now are every bit as good or better than the things going on over there. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Victor, because it's certainly something that I believe. Um, we have less of it. Yeah. I mean, the thing about New York and those sorts of places is it's about critical mass. Um, New York still draws the cream of, of the, you know, the most interesting young players to it at some point. We all go there. I'm not always sure why we go there because it's not always the most, you know, revelatory place. You know, you don't always have an epiphany mm. in New York. But there is something about the place. I mean, I love that city very much. And, um, well, you know, it's given us, it has written the history of contemporary jazz music to a great degree. And pr will probably continue to do that. I mean, mm. I can't imagine it not doing that into the future. But the thing is that jazz has now grown beyond its roots. It started in New Orleans. I describe jazz as like a virus. Jazz morphed into something called jazz and then it started to circulate around the United States. And then because jazz and the advent of the recording kind of coincided, mm. the idea of the music through recordings of the music became very widespread, crossed the Atlantic, started to get imitators in various other places, including Australia. Um, and Although the real changes in the music, the major shifts in the music, continued to happen in the States, meanwhile, various offshoots or versions of it were happening in other places all over the world. And now it's true to say that jazz is a really international language. And I prefer to think of jazz these days as you know, a way of doing things rather than a thing. Mm. Jazz, for me, is not a noun, it's more of an adverb. I, I think of a jazz way of looking at music, by which I mean it's about improvisation, it's about rhythm, it's about you know, spontaneous creativity married to very sophisticated compositions, it's about uh, the individual voice 
and the way that the individual voice speaks in a group. Hmm. You know, they are very specific kinds of things. So just on that, so you're, you're talking about, I guess, jazz as an evolving and encompassing music, and I, I've heard you talk before about your view of what the 21st century musician mm. is all about. Where do you see jazz going? Uh, and I, I imagine in your role now as an educator at, at Monash, you know, where, where do you think music is going in this country, and where's jazz? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Victor, and it's a very big question. And I have a, a, an answer to that which some people find a little difficult to swallow, but it goes like this. For those of us who are interested in music, for whom music has been something of an important part of our lives, whether as a player or a listener, and I must say that I do look at those two things as being kind of equal parts of a, or equal points on a curve, because without a listener, we don't have a musical experience. People who have grown up in the 20th century will know that classical music has always been held up as being in some kind of a way very important and worthy of our attention in a different kind of a way from other sorts of music. And as a result of that, we have an entire infrastructure of buildings, of orchestras, vast amounts of money spent on maintaining that particular aspect of our culture. We understand it as being something that underpins what, for better or worse, is known as Western civilization. Now, that music that we, we are so crazy about, and in many cases for very, very good reasons, most of it was written between 1600 and 1900. The music that happened before 1600 in Western music, not a lot of us know a lot about. I mean, people who love early music think about that in the same terms that I might think about jazz. They are absolutely in love with it. And the music which was written after 1900 is, in some cases, embraced, in some cases, it's tolerated, and in many cases, it's reviled. But it does nevertheless belong under the heading classical music. Now, what's happening in the 21st century, and actually it was already happening well and truly during the 20th century, was that there were other very powerful currents surging up from the wrong side of the railway tracks that were changing the way we think about music. And it's very interesting that the major forces that have changed music in the 20th century are largely coming from African Americans the children and grandchildren of the slaves whose slavery economy helped to make America the wealthy power it became. Jazz music has taught us an awful lot about what music actually is. And I can tell you that having been a jazz musician, I've come back to classical music with a whole new set of ears and a far greater understanding for myself about the way it's constructed, the way it works, the best way to perform it, the best way to love it. But the old idea that it is a priori better music, or better for you, mm. or somehow morally more worthy, or containing more righteousness than other music, I totally contest. And the 21st century musician will be a musician who understands music, not just classical music, but what music really is about. And then knowing that, if they then choose to play classical music, they will do it with far more understanding, far more commitment, far more determination. They'll be far better at it because they will also know where it sits in relation to everything else. And that will cause us to reflect upon many things. Um, many things. The future of the symphony orchestra, for one. The future of the opera companies, for another. I'm not saying that these things won't exist anymore. But I will say this. Composers alive now 
are far more likely to write for uh, a completely different type of musical ensemble than they are to write for a symphony orchestra because our symphony orchestras don't play very much new music. They hardly play any, really, and they play very little Australian music. So I'll just put that out there for your delectation. But, um, you know, the things that we might take for granted, some of the hallowed ideas that we hold about the hierarchy of art are not necessarily things that hold up to closer scrutiny. Which is part of, you know, partly why I'm very excited about working at Monash, because at Monash we are very concerned about the idea of the 21st century musician. And some people are worried about this. They, they think, oh, they're turning it into a jazz school. You know, it's going to be about, all about jazz. Well, of course it's not. You know, because I feel the same way about jazz as I do about classical music. Jazz is just one thing which happened. I don't even think of jazz in that old sort of sense of the word as 21st century music. To me, jazz is a 20th century word. The jazz era was definitely in the 20th century. I look at what we do in, a, in my music now as, if you like, post-jazz. Not that that's a word which I've ever seen in print, but maybe it's not unuseful. Is that a word? Maybe Let's it's not it. useless. So, Paul, let's go to that, because you said, I guess, in some ways, jazz was shaped in America, updated the classical music traditions of America and fused it with the African-American music tradition, yep. in some ways, to create jazz as we know it. What do you think is the future of Australian music in particular? I imagine here in a very multicultural society with very strong Asian influences, is there, do you think, the potential for a unique Australian expression of music to develop? Well, you know, we need to grow up as a nation to really come to terms with those kinds of things. I still think we're a very kind of pubescent country, Australia. I think we're very focused on, you know, on the, on the small picture, not on the big picture. You know, we're very concerned about money, too concerned about it. We're very kind of afraid. I think our, you know, our vision of ourselves is, is a sort of inward-looking, suspicious vision, you know, suspicious of our neighbours and not quite understanding where we fit in. I think Australia has enormous potential, enormous potential. You know, Australia, in a way, is kind of like, in certain ways, in more positive ways, sort of like where America was at, you know, maybe in the 1870s or 1880s. It's, you know, kind of in a boom period, a boom period, but, you know, we don't know what to do with that. We don't know where that boom fits into things. You know, we, we don't have the philanthropic culture that America did. We don't see these people who are, you know, making all of this money out of, you know, dust, channeling it back into, into creating a great culture, a great vision. We still, as a nation, think of the arts as a sort of peripheral activity. You know, we kind of navel gaze and, and agonise over not having a million gold medals at the Olympics, but we don't agonise over the fact that most of our most creative people are living beneath the poverty line in this country. Now, that's something we should be agonising about. It's uh, an absolute test of a nation's metal, uh, the health of its creative people, its creative scene. And I think we have a lot of work to do. Now, one thing that Australians should never forget is that we are the lucky inheritors of the oldest performative and artistic culture in the world. The oldest in the world. And that is our indigenous people. There are many, many cultures, of course, amongst our indigenous people. And we lump them all together into one, but there are many, hundreds. And we have much to learn about the way they make art, because they don't divide art into different bits. You know, we have kind of applied an industrial paradigm to what they do through giving canvas and paint and, you know, things are created and things are sold and things gain value, etc. But I know from having, you know, worked with Indigenous people a lot that the understanding which goes, comes behind all of that is about the, interrelate, the interrelatedness of all things. You know, for Aboriginal people, the creative act is, a, is an expression of 
everything. And it's, a, it's an illustration or a metaphor for the way everything interrelates. So for every painting, there is a song. For every song, there is a place. And there's the travel to that place, the movement to a place. That is part of the gesture. There's a dance as well. Now, all of these things are one thing. Now, that is a tremendously uh, informative and, and inspiring thing to, to, to be in touch with. You know, and I think, again, we, we haven't really made the most of the opportunity that we have to learn from our Indigenous people. Uh, and as an Australian artist, I would like to see that, first and foremost, really kind of elevated to its right place at the table. And then, yes, there is our area. There is Asia, but there is also the Pacific, fascinating treasure trove of incredible cultures. On all of those Pacific islands, there are amazing, you know, amazing cultural legacies. PNG, wow. You know, again, thousands of cultures in PNG. You know, to say nothing of Indonesia and beyond. I mean, look, we already know, you know, the, the, the cat's out of the bag. The, the Anglo-Saxon paradigm uh, in terms of a demographic, it's over. Now, anybody who thinks that it's about that, they're dreaming, they're deluded. Now, we are moving on, and Australia will be a truly multicultural place. Mm. So, Paul, what I understand from what I'm hearing is that to you, in a lot of ways, music and art is a way to reflect the culture that we're living in in society. Um, and I, I noticed that in your music, you actually are very open to incorporating musics from different cultures and world musics with the Australian Art Orchestra. You've done work with Balinese Gamelan, mm -hmm. which is a fundamentally different tonal and rhythmic system. Mm -hmm. And now you're working uh, with indigenous communities mm -hmm. uh, in incorporating, I guess, infusing musical traditions. Yeah. I was actually wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you do that uh, oh, when you have such different musical systems and to combine those maybe even show us a little bit on the piano if we are uh, up for it. Okay, I, I will do that. Um, be before I go to the piano though, I'll just explain something. Uh, first thing is I, I work with one particular community um, in Arnhem Land, uh, which is in a place called Nooka. Nooka is on the Roper River in southeastern Arnhem Land. It's quite a remote community, but quite a large community. And um, it's in, in a very beautiful place. The Roper is, is an extraordinary watercourse and it's a, it's a magnificent place. Now, it's a, like many Aboriginal communities, it's not without its problems, but then, you know, uh, what community is not without its problems? But um, what they are uh, are a very creative community and there's a lot of music there, both contemporary music, bands, and traditional music. And when I first went there, about eight years ago, I was very fortunate to be able to meet songmen, custodians of traditional ceremonial material, and started to talk to them about the possibility of working with the musicians that I work with in the Australian Art Orchestra, who are some of my favourite musicians in the world and incredibly creative people, to make something together, to create music together. Um, and for them, you know, that was a very unusual request, but very exciting, because I think maybe they had not been used to the idea of a white man coming into their community and saying, I really want to learn about what you do. Not just from a musicological point of view, I wasn't coming with a tape recorder to you know, record what their songs and, and transcribe them and do a PhD on it. Although that, of course, is a very useful thing too for all kinds of reasons. I really wanted to make music with these people and to try and learn from a musical performing point of view about this music. And so I quickly got to learn mm. that it's not that simple. They, because, you know, they don't do a concert of that music. The music is for a reason. Everything is for a reason. They have to have a reason to play the music. So they might have a bungal, which is, you know, like a, what we would call a corroboree, bungal in Yolngu language. 
uh, at which you know certain songs can be performed. Of course, certain songs can't be performed. I, I have no right to hear certain songs. But there are certain songs that we can learn, and they taught us these songs. And over a long period of time, we began to learn about this music. Now, I will go over the piano at this point. I mean, look at this. It's got nothing to do with Aboriginal culture, right? You couldn't have a much more Western instrument than the piano. It's 19th century cutting-edge technology. And um, I love it. But it's very limited, the piano. It's limited in certain very profound ways. The piano is an expression of a tuning system in music which was invented in the early 18th century during the time of Bach to enable composers to modulate, which means change key, across all 12 keys in music. And in order to be able to do that, we had to create what is called an equally tempered scale. And the equally tempered scale is not a normal, natural scale. It's been adjusted in order to give the illusion of equality between the different keys. But it's not a natural thing. And before it was invented, you couldn't modulate from the key of C this chord here to this chord. That's the chord of F sharp. That's as far away as you can get from C. And in our music, we've got this thing called a circle of fifths. You know that we have a... I'm just going to get a little bit musical, but I'll try and keep it as simple as I can. We've got 12 notes. in our chromatic scale. But there's another way of playing those notes. You can play it like this. And so on, until you get around. Or like this. Now that was all the 12 notes of the chromatic scale, but organized into a different kind of way. Now, in Aboriginal music, they don't care about that. That plays no role. That's only interesting, really, for music that has harmony. And in Aboriginal music, there isn't really any sense of what we would call harmony, nor is there, for that matter, in Indian music, in one of the great classical traditions in the world. There's no harmony in Indian music. It's all built on scales over drones. And Aboriginal music, indeed, is built over drones. And the drone instrument in the north of Australia is what we call the didgeridoo, which they up there call the yidaki. But that was never a southern instrument. So the didgeridoo was not something played in the south of the Australian continent. It's a northern instrument. And it's made out of a hollowed out tree trunk. We all know that. And it's played with a remarkable breathing technique called circular breathing, so that the sound is continuous with a particular way of breathing which, in which you breathe in while you breathe out. But the very interesting thing about the yadaki, or the didgeridoo, is that it's not just a drone instrument, it is also what we might call the rhythm section. And the way they play, and very often the, the group that I play with, their didgeridoo is tuned to F sharp, well, when it's warmed up anyway. They'll play something like this. All those notes are being played on the didgeridoo with a similar degree of complexity. And what is sung over that is a, a kind of a melodic mode, and there are different scales that occur in this music. But a simple one might be something which sounds a little bit like a pentatonic scale, which means it's got five tones in it. It's 
something like that. But really, they don't sing the notes purely like that. Every note has got a myriad of incredible little inflections in it, the microtonal shifts, different kinds of use of the throat, extraordinary shaping. And if you can imagine the detail in a bark painting from Arnhem Land, the cross hatching and the amazing detail, that's also in the music. There's detail inside, in the inner world of every note. And sometimes when more than one person is singing, which is often the case, they'll have, at the end of a phrase, they might go... Something like that. And then they'll finish the phrase... Like that. And then they'll tr somebody will trail off. But somebody else will trail off. And somebody else will... So you get this cascade of all these different voices doing this extraordinary stuff. Very, very beautiful, very special music. And so, um, you know, how do we adapt to that? Well, as a pianist, I have a very different role to play. So I might get into, you know, the rhythmic patterns and, and do some interesting chordal things. do a different kind of fundamental underneath the adaki, so it's down here. But the best thing is that the other instruments, they've got far more opportunity to interact because, you know, we have a violinist, wonderful violinist and viola player called Eki Veltheim in our group. You know, he has the ability to be able to adjust pitch to whatever he wants to do and he is an expert in playing microtonally so he can accurately play quarter tones and sixth tones. And then we have, you know, s players of reed instruments. Tony Hicks is a great multi-instrumentalist. He adjusts his pitch too. Um, of course, we have a drummer, Nico Schäuble, who's able to work in with the, the yadaki and we get in, inside the rhythmic modes of the music. Um, you know, and we have guitar, Again, it's a, it's a microtonal instrument, potentially. So, you know, we've figured out ways of doing it, but we try and play the spirit of the music, and we definitely play the form of the music. And the most important thing is that they understand. That's what I was going to ask. What do the, the song men that you work with make of this attempt? They, are, they recognize it as being their music. And whenever they are singing these songs, they are singing up the land. So if they were here tonight, they'd be singing up their land. That's what they're doing. We're going to play in London and Paris in November. They will be singing up their land. Nilipidji is the land in London, London and Paris. They will be putting Nilipidji in the Purcell Room at Southbank. Or they will be putting Nilipidji in the, uh, the Key Bronley Museum in Paris. You know, they, for them, that's what they're doing. And everything that we're doing is a part of that song. If it's that, if it's that song, then that's what it is. And we had to get the permission to be able to do that in order for that to be a reality. But there is, for them, no differentiation. We, and with that comes tremendous responsibility for us. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking of music that, I guess, tells of story and, and place, you're also extremely well known as a film score composer. Uh, I wish I was better known as a film score composer. <laughs> well, my favourite is Jungle Book 2, uh, which I think is great fun. <laughs> Uh, and, and shows off the way that colour and music in the score really enhance. We've also done a lot of serious films uh, in Australia as well. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit as well and about what you really think about when you're writing music to go behind a scene and how, how you evoke a sense of place in your own composition. Well, you know, the creative, uh, the creative moment is a very mysterious moment. And... We're trying to understand it, and I'm sure some of the best minds at Monash University are trying to understand it all the time. My own view of it, if you like, is that creativity has got something to do with memory. I think, you know, we take in a lot of information and then we reconstruct that information um, in an infinite variety of ways. And really, creativity is, is about 
constructing models of information in your brain uh, which are informed by a whole raft of things and then come out as a coherent fact, if you like, as an object. Um, but nevertheless, even if it were possible to analyse how that happens, it remains truly mysterious and therefore of great beauty. I would never want it to be completely explicable because then it would stop happening. And I think part of the reason why we make things is because we don't know why we do it. Mm. And I'd prefer it to be like that. Working in film, well, that's a collaborative medium. One of the things that film composers need to be able to do is not be precious about their music. They have to be able to kiss it goodbye and understand that once you've handed it over, it may not be used in the way that you intended it necessarily. But luckily for me, I tend to work with directors who are very collaborative in that sense and that you know we've gone through so many discussions up to the point where the music is finally made that we are all pretty much on the same page about how it will be used. In the Hollywood system, there are other layers of interference which you have to run. You know, if you look at a film and see the list of executive producers, they are normally people who may decide to not use your score because they've got a, you know, very strong ideas about the music. Normally rather badly informed, I've found in my experiences, but nevertheless, um, these people often are the people who write the checks for a particular project, so what can you do? Um, music in film are, uh, is arrived at via discussions, firstly, and the gaining of trust, and um, then the reading of a script, and then, for me, a long process of uh, ingestion, um, and finally something comes out, hopefully when it's supposed to. So sometimes, you know, that all that script reading and, and early discussions might happen months before you're actually asked to write the music, but when it happens, you've had a long time to think about it. And I find that that kind of cooking process is very important, mm. that, you know, you've, something's been cooking away, and finally when you go, okay, well, now we have to actually start doing it, often it comes out fully formed after that time because you've been working on it subliminally for such a long time. Um, so when, when you write, I mean, do you, do you tend to come up with a, a theme for each character and then develop it? or Sometimes, yeah. I mean, look, again, it's, it's really... That, that's something that the, the, the director normally has very strong views on. For me, I normally respond to the pictures because I know that the music has to exist in a relationship to those pictures and it has to do something normally that the pictures are not doing. Music that does what the pictures are doing, it's what we call Mickey Mousing in film music world. Really, all it's doing is pumping the, mus pumping the movie with steroids, you know, or it's, it's kind of attempting to mask the fact that the movie is absolutely terrible and that if you took the music away, everybody would leave the theatre. If you fill the, the, the sound in the theatre with music and lots of effects, and you will, I'm sure, agree with me that it's been getting louder and louder and louder with each passing day. It's almost kind of unbearably loud now to go to a particularly an action-adventure movie. It's like going to a rock and roll gig, you know. Um, the music is all about generating some kind of excitement and making people feel on the edge of their seat. Uh, so it's completely manipulative. And some music will make you feel sad and make you want to cry. And that's also being very manipulative. Mm. But then there's some really, truly great film music which does something else completely. My favourite example, or one of them, is uh, Bernard Herrmann's score for Vertigo, the great Alfred Hitchcock film. You know, in that, the music does all kinds of things. It tells us things about the characters that we don't necessarily know. It tells us that the Jimmy Stewart character is terribly, terribly sad and desperately in need of being loved. 
And it tells us that, you know, the Kim Novak character is not all that she seems, even before we know how it all transpires. We know that something's not right. Now, the music doesn't hit us over the head with what we're supposed to feel. It makes very subtle suggestions. And they're my favourite film scores. Wow. Well, Paul, it would be remiss of me not to ask, given we're sitting here and given where many people in this room might know you from first, uh, is The Visor Tonight Show with Steve Visard. <laughs> and uh, that's way before my time, but I watched some clips of it, and it looks like a lot of fun. Oh, it was great fun, yeah. And uh, really using music to set, set a vibe, right, for the show and really create an energy. Oh, look, it was fantastic. Of course, everybody now realises that it was a kind of um, very long impression of David Letterman, uh, like doing a, a very vast um, sort of spoof of another program. But I can say in all honesty uh, that I didn't really know that myself at the time. I was aware that there was this thing called the David Letterman Show that apparently we were modelling our show on, but I never really wanted to watch it. Uh, I saw it once and I saw the band and I thought, well, that, that's fine, but that's certainly not what I want to do with the music on our show. So um, I made sure that you know, we had a band which was really great players, but that we had a kind of a musical thing going on which lent more in an obviously jazzy direction a lot of the time. And that used to get us into all manner of strife with um, the network executives. They, they didn't like that one little bit. And <laughs> my favourite story about those days was, um, you know, in the first year of the show, we could do no wrong. You know, the show just created a, a, a kind of ratings demographic that didn't even exist before in that time slot. It was going through the roof, and we were all TV stars, and the network was getting a whole lot of advertising revenue from this show. But, of course, they had to pick on something. They had to get their fingers into something, so it was always the music. And um, one day I had a particular network executive come to me, and he said, now, you know, we're still very concerned about the music. And what I've done is I've had my secretary draw up a playlist of what she thinks the music should be that you should play on this show. And, you know, I got the list and I put it, you know, very quickly in the waste paper basket and went on with business as usual. But, you know, they were always trying to get the tail to wag the dog, so to speak. Um, and the poor secretary, I felt very, very sorry for her. Personal assistant, it would be called today. Um, but there you go. It, we fought a series of rearguard actions. And I've got to say, in Steve's defence, he was always in there rooting for us as well. Um, and it was great fun. You know, we had a great time. But it was, it was a, quite a gruelling schedule, doing it five nights a week. That was tough. I can imagine. That was tough. Well, Paul, that brings us close to the end. And I know everyone is excited to hear you play. And we've, we've talked a lot about music is reflecting the space and the emotions. And I know in your, your own writings you talk about improvised music as being about the relationship between the performer and the audience. So I was wondering if we could hand over to you to play something evocative of tonight. I'd love to, Victor. But before I do, I'll just say this. Um, luckily f for me, I mean, it's, it's incredible to have this opportunity to be able to talk. And I think, you know, your questions have been wonderful and I thank you for them. Um, tonight, after this event, I, I have a concert at Bennett's Lane, which is just you know, a few block, blocks away, where we are playing completely improvised music. So it, I feel like this is almost the first set, you know. I was going to advertise after this, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the, uh, the improvised uh, overture to what will be an improvised event in a couple of hours' time. So I am just going to play something for a few minutes. Uh, I'll, I'm just going to be playing the space, playing our thing that we've got happening tonight and you know the very important thing for me is that I, I might be making the music but the way you receive it each individual of you uh, is as important in this music's little trajectory as my making of it um, so I hope you enjoy
Lewandowski.